fact, as we know, as the state budget is being negotiated, a huge portion of the general operating budget is dedicated to education in North Carolina, whether it's K-12 or the community college system or the university system. A huge chunk of our tax dollars go to educate North Carolinians in our public institutions. Well, the uh, governor's administration, of course, has um, some advisors to help alert the governor to how they see education going in the future, and they have ac actually a mission to innovate. Well, the governor's senior education advisor is our guest today. She is Catherine Truitt, and if any of you live in Johnston County, uh, you might be interested to know that she formerly taught in Johnston County. She was a school teacher herself, and she's done a lot of really fascinating things. Um, she actually had moved to Chicago at one point in her career where she co-founded a K-8 parent-run private school on Chicago's South Side. She followed that with three years of teaching in the British school system. Then after she returned to the United States, she settled in Raleigh where she taught American Lit to 11th graders at West Johnson High School. She's now the governor's senior education advisor. And today she's going to be talking to us about our public education system and how it has uh, largely remained unchanged for about 130 years, if you can believe that. And uh, so the governor's office, his administration, does have a mission to innovate through a variety of different activities. And Catherine Truitt is here to explain to us what that is all about. With that, please welcome Catherine Truitt. Thank you, Thank you, you so much. I'm going to ask you to put that Please, uh, yeah. What's the best? Just a moment. Wardrobe Can here. Lavalier up. I think that'll do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna, for that great introduction. Um, and thank you all for having me and for coming out over your lunch hour to learn a little bit about what's going on in education in our state and what's not going on in education in our state. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask for some audience participation in a few minutes, and so if you have a tablet or a phone, you might want to get that out. And um, if you need Wi-Fi, the uh, password is JLF12345. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. I, I, the title of my presentation is A Mission to Innovate, because now more than ever is the time that we need to start being innovative in our public school space. <clears throat> and as you will see from my presentation, I argue that we have not been innovative um, up until recently and that we still have a long way to go, absolutely. And so what I would like to spend the next hour doing is talking to you about where we have been in our education system, um, what needs to change and why, you know, what our challenges are, and what the state is doing and what this administration is doing to help facilitate those changes. Um, so, Donna, that was such a great introduction, and I don't usually get a nice introduction like that, so I have some slides just to give you a little bit of background on myself. But um, I grew up in Cincinnati and graduated from Cincinnati Public Schools, um, and then decided bef before going to college that I wanted to go and live overseas for a year and work, which I can't believe my parents let me do, but, but they did. And I happened to be living outside of Frankfurt the year the wall fell. And it was an incredible, incredible time. It would have been incredible even if the wall hadn't come down when I was there. But um, I w happened to be in the city of Frankfurt the day the borders fell and saw the East Germans just pouring in in their funny little cars. And you, know, you could spot them a mile away. Um, and of course, meeting people who were just a generation removed from World War II was an incredible experience, for sure. Um, I came back, went to the University of Maryland, got my degree in English, and met a guy at the Naval Academy, as some people are known to do when they're down that way. And he uh, became Denzel Washington, was stationed on the <laughs> USS Alabama as a submariner, and uh, we, we were married uh, right after graduation. Um, we lived in Washington State, where I got my, my master's degree in education. And then we moved to Chicago, where after five years in submarines, the Navy lateraled my husband into the JAG Corps. So we went to law school in Chicago, which is, as Donna said, where I helped start a, a private school on the south side. Um, then he became Tom Cruise and a few good men. So um, as, after he became a JAG, uh, we moved to Jacksonville, Florida. 
and then overseas to London for four years. Three of those years I taught in the British school system, which, which was an, an incredible experience. Um, that's, a, that's a day for, that's a talk for another time. Um, and then we decided after 15 years that it was, it was time. We, our, kid, our oldest had started school and um, just didn't want to move around anymore. And so we settled in North Carolina and I started teaching at West Johnston High School. And then after three years, the opportunity to consult fell on my lap. And I think my career took a very interesting turn at this point because I started consulting in underperforming schools, which is code for failing schools. Um, <clears throat> and so I, tra I've, I traveled um, really all across the country, um, either working long term in schools or just going for a day or two to present about things that schools could be doing better. Um, but my, my main project projects were in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Gary, Indiana, and Dayton, Ohio. Um, three, ver three, three places that are not dissimilar to one another with very high levels of, of poverty. Um, <clears throat> completely, I mean, I, I, I had taught in schools with poverty before, but not 90% poverty. So very, very eye-opening um, and altered the way that I felt about public education for sure. So before we go any further, I would, um, this is the audience participation portion of the program. So I would like to ask you to go to a website called kahoot.it. So kahoot is spelled K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. And I'll give you a second while you get in there. Kahoot.it. And I've got a couple of questions to ask you. What was that? It changes colors. Yeah, it does. You should you should get a screen that asks you to enter a pin. Is everybody there? So go ahead and enter that pin. Give yourself a nickname. It's not going to remember your name. No data is being collected. Anybody else? So, oh, yo, dude, there's one. Anybody else? Ready? Okay. So it's going to ask you a series of four questions, and you will need to look up on the screen to see what the, the choices will be on your phone. But I think on I think if it's on your phone, you just see the colors and. It's gonna, you know, your choices will be like yes, no, sometimes, maybe, and you'll the key will be will be up here. You'll have about 20 seconds to answer. So here's the first one. Did you like school? Yes, no, or sometimes. Okay, so nine people said yes, five people said sometimes, and two people said no. All right, next question. Do you remember being bored in school? <clears throat> yes, no, or sometimes? So most of you remember being bored in school. Third, rate the quality of the education of our public schools um, on a scale of one to, f to four. So four is the best. Okay, so the majority of people, thank you, thank you, oh, thank you so much. The majority of people rated them on a scale of one to four as a two. 
Rate the extent to which our public schools meet the learning needs of all students, with four being best. <clears throat> okay, again, so not the worst, but definitely not the best, right? So there's a trend here, and um, I think that's it. Yep. And just, uh, are there any teachers in the audience, by the way? Probably not, because you'd be at school. OK. So you can then, um, if I click Save Results on this, because you could do this for any type of quiz or you know, check, check learning, you can, if I download, it imports automatically into an Excel document. So um, kind of an, a, neat little, a neat little tool to use. All right, so I'm going to go, let's see, I'm not a Mac person, so I'm going to try and go, blah, where's my presentation? Um, go back to window. Win, not new window. The window menu. The window menu. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. All right, and we will just, can I go from, so, well, I'll just start it over and scroll through, that's fine. That's probably quickest than <laughs> me. Oops. Let's, let's go back. Okay. And is that going to expand? Is that going to? Nope. Pull down. There we go. Okay. Is there? Okay. This one. Yeah. Oh, just like on Netflix. Okay. All right. So <laughs> the, the real, yeah, exactly, exactly. So past innovation. So what's the deal with this claim that our education system hasn't changed in 130 years, um, or here it says 120 years? I think it, it doesn't come as a surprise to know that our, that 120 years ago it was a different economic system, right? Primarily agrarian and industrial. Um, our education system, as we know it, pretty much began when Horace Mann up in Massachusetts decided he, he had gone overseas, saw the Prussian education system, which dumped kids by age into various grades, which we now call age grading. Um, and actually, very innovative for its time, um, said that the state needs to pay for a free education for everyone. So. That was a great way to produce factory workers, right? To produce people who just kind of needed to keep their heads down and not ask a whole lot of questions. So here's a, here's a picture of, a, of an auto factory from 1913. Here's a high school classroom from around the same time. But a lot has changed since then. Here's what an auto factory looks like today, right? It's incredibly different, incredible, lots more complex. But here's what our schools still pretty much look like, right? I mean, there have been some changes. Um, and not every classroom looks like this. But by and large, this is what our classrooms look like. So I think of education the way it stands now is an assembly line. You've got buckets or grades. And kids are funneled into these grades based on their age and only their age. Our determination of whether or not they have mastered content is based on seat time rather than whether or not they've actually learned anything. And what is fixed is the age and the bucket. But what is variable, of course, is what did they learn? So again, our system of education is rooted in the economy of the 19th century, not the 21st. So why is that a problem? Well, 1970, 80% of any given class graduated from high school. 14% of men went on to get a four-year degree, 8% of women. And those who didn't were still able to get a decent paying job, right? Um, the expectation now is that we will educate everyone. And that is an American phenomenon. 
When I taught in the British school system, if you had a child with special needs and your neighborhood school could not meet the needs of your child, whether it was physical or otherwise, they were not required by law to adapt their school to meet the needs of your child. And then you would just go to the closest school that did. And you might say, well, you could move, but especially in the southern half of the UK where it's more crowded, there are a finite number of places at school. So if any of you have kids in Cary, like I do, where schools are capped, and then you get sent to your overflow school, that's the situation in the UK. They do not have to provide a space for you at your local school. So the idea that we educate everyone is, is great, and it's right and proper to do so, but there are consequences of that because other countries, some other countries only educate their best and brightest, right? So in 1979, we had about 20 million manufacturing jobs in the country, 2015, 12 million. And that's where people who did not graduate from high school often tended to go and work and had a benefits package and were able to lead a middle class life. So I have recently added some slides to my presentation because I think that they help my audience understand what current challenges face our economy and our schools. And those are slides around changing demographics. Um, this slide shows by region what the population change was between 2010 and 2013. So if you look just in the US, we grew 2.2%, but the, our state alone grew 2.7%. So our population, a lot, many states' population are declining. Ours is growing. And what age do you think is moving here, by and large? Yeah. People don't say, oh, I can't wait to retire and move to New York. They say, I can't wait to retire and move to North Carolina. So we have an aging population here. If you look at the, the change of race and ethnic composition in our public schools, what you see is that the percent change in Hispanic population since 2000 is 171 percent. And whites, negative 0.2 percent. <coughs> and then when you look at fertility rates in North Carolina, for every 49, or I'm sorry, 40, the, the median age for white women in North Carolina is 42.9, which means that out of 1,000 women in North Carolina, only 49 are of childbearing age. But when you look at, at other groups, like Hispanics, 99 out of 1,000 are of childbearing age. White children are no longer the statistical majority in North Carolina. They make up 49%. I went to, um, my kids are all in Wake County Public Schools, and I had an opportunity to go to my, my, I have a, my youngest is in the first grade, and I went to his classroom, there were seven, seven languages, different languages spoken in his classroom in Cary. I don't know how his teacher does it, I really don't. First year teacher, 27 kids, 27 first graders, seven different languages spoken, I was by far the oldest parent there. Again, 1960, our foreign-born population was about 22,000. 2012, almost 750,000. The country as a whole, in 1900, we had very different immigration laws um, ex that, that, were, that excluded Middle Easterners, um, Hispanics, and Asian people from coming here. In 2015, or 2014, it's 42 and a half million. Big, big changes. Then when we look at the change in age, we see here that the biggest change is 45 to 65 and older. So again, people coming to retire here 
and just the the you know the baby boomers are aging. This is this is a phenomenon that I've heard described as the browning and the graying of America. So the average number of people who turn 65 every day in the US is 8,000, which is about five and a half people every minute. So what does this all mean? Skill demands have changed in the national and the North Carolina labor market. And what, what my office calls the new minimum is a post-secondary education. So some training beyond high school and college is essential if you are going to stay above the poverty line. So this is something that the aligning workforce and education demands is something that the governor talked about when he campaigned and something he addressed in his first state of the state. And around the same time, Georgetown University's Public Policy Center came out with a paper um, detailing our education and workforce needs moving into 2020. And the, the state-specific data for North Carolina indicated that we would need to have 67% of our working population with some post-secondary training and education. So, this has become a goal of the administration that you will start to hear more and more about. Um, there are several different groups within the administration, um, including folks from, from Commerce and the community colleges, working on this 67% workforce goal. Um, and we will not meet, I'll, I'll explain, I know this is small, I'll explain what it says. We are not going to meet that workforce goal without our community colleges. So right here, what we see, the blue bar represents the 2014 labor force, which by the way, we're at 54%. So we're, we're at 54%, we need to be at 67%. So here, the, 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 the blue is the labor force, the 2025 job demand is in green. So this indicates that we are going to have a surplus of folks with a high school diploma only or less. We're going to have a, five, a 540,000 person deficit of jobs that require an associate degree or some college or a, an industry certificate, right? Like welding or HVAC or something like that. We'll have a smaller deficit of people with bachelor degrees and another deficit of people with master's degree or higher. So too many lawyers. We, I said, I said, oh, this, oh, that's it. I'll cross over here. Thank you. So what, what I would say is that our education system hasn't changed in 130 years, but think about how much has changed in the last 10 to 15 years. I mean, forget about the last 100 years. Just think about how smartphones have changed our lives forever. They changed the way we work and play and even sleep. Has anybody downloaded the Sleep Cycle app? So you can see, you can, it, will, it will give you, it will quantify the quality of sleep that you're getting. And let me tell you, I didn't think this thing was gonna work. It totally works. Because um, I haven't been sleeping since I took this job. Because <laughs> so, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. So this is what employers want. And when I go to, when, when, when I talk to, to business owners, they tell me all the time, I can't find people with the skill set that I need. Um, because our schools don't teach this. They teach kids how to take a test, right? They teach kids how to remember information. It goes in one ear and out the other. Our schools don't teach critical thinking. They don't teach soft skills. And if kids don't learn those at home, you know, fill in the blank. So technology has changed what it means to be college and career ready. My take on this is that it's, it's not our teachers who are, who are failing, it's the system that we have. Teachers really are doing the best with the system that they have. 
So let's talk for a minute about what we're doing. Maybe we'll get some good news out of this, right? So as I said, we are working very steadfast in trying to achieve the 67% workforce goal. There was a, a very large workforce summit in Greensboro in October of this past year. At that time, the governor was on stage with all of our workforce and education chairs, board chairs, and he challenged them to draft a resolution in support of the 67% workforce goal. They did. Those resolutions were drafted and passed and presented at the January Education Cabinet meeting and were made public. And at the end of that meeting, uh, I, I challenged the um, members of the Education Cabinet, which includes the Secretary of Commerce, by the way, and the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to appoint a working group to work with me to figure out how are we going to measure this workforce goal? How will we know that we're moving the needle? Because it's going to mean, as you saw from those demographics, it's going to mean bringing in people that have not necessarily been successful in the system that we have for whatever reason. And it's also going to mean bringing in people who are between the ages of 25 and 64 back into the workforce. So right now, we have developed those benchmarks. They were presented at the April Education Cabinet meeting. And the next Education Cabinet meeting, which will be at the end of September, and those meetings are open to the public, by the way, end of September, um, we will be, th those benchmarks will have been converted to metrics. So our four-year system is going to, to say publicly, we are going to increase graduation rates by X percent. Or DPI is going to say, we will increase the number of kids participating in dual enrollment programs in our state and graduating with college credit by X percent. So, digital learning. So, a little history here. Um, the General Assembly passed legislation in 2013 mandating that the state begin a transition to digital learning, which is to say um, using um, digital age materials instead of printed text. It takes about 10 years for a textbook to go through a review process, and then it finally gets in the kids' hands. It's, in the science, it's even worse because science is changing week by week, right? So we want, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in more detail about what I mean when I say digital learning, but um, this was not an unfunded mandate. There has been funding by the General Assembly to connect our whole state, all of our schools and learning spaces to Wi-Fi. So every school has a little bit of, I mean, every school has a, you know, a, a Wi-Fi entry point, right? But they don't, what they don't have is the kind of Wi-Fi that you need to hook up a whole class on a device, like the kind of Wi-Fi that's in here. So the Friday Institute at NC State, and just a, what is an example of a great university government partnership, has really been leading the way with working with the feds at the E-rate commission to change the way that, 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 that those federal E-rate dollars are distributed. And as a result, we will be one of the first states to have total connectivity throughout the, the, the state in our schools. Um, we were at 22% when the governor took office. We're currently at 63%, and we will be at 100% by the end of 2018. It's been funded already. Um, and so we, the governor's budget has $29 million in this, this cycle for training teachers on how to use technology in the classroom, as well as allowing um, districts to purchase digital content and resources. So I, I want to talk a little bit more in more detail about what digital age learning is. Um, the governor always says to me, the average voter is 60 and they don't know what you mean when you say that. And they, they, they hear digital learning and they think, digital cable? Huh? What's, what's that? Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of hard to put into words how powerful this is, but, but I'm going to try and I'm going to try and give you an analogy. So as I mentioned earlier, I have spent a lot of time in the past four years in high poverty schools. Your average high poverty school is a very depressing place to be. Um, I mean, I've seen kids with bed bugs. I've seen kids with holes in their clothes. 
I've seen kindergartners that can't string a sentence together because nobody talks to them at home. Their language deficits that they start with are enough to just make you want to throw in the towel altogether. Um, since I took this role in October, I've been in about 100 digital age learning classrooms. We've got a, a good handful of counties that have rock star superintendents who have figured out how to do this without state funding. And they've nickeled and dimed it together, and they're just about ready to run out of money, which is why it's crucial that this gets passed in this session. But um, what I saw made me a believer. I, and th these are, I'll talk about those counties in a little bit, but they, are, they are, tend to be rural counties, very high poverty, and the only way that you would know that these kids were poor was because they had holes in their clothes. You go into the room, every kid was engaged, which I just, I just can't even tell you I, the chaos that I have seen in other schools. It, it, it's just mind-blowing. But you, you go in, first of all, you don't know where the teacher is because the, because the teacher is, Greg, <laughs> because <laughs> the teacher is kneeling down working with a small group of kids on the floor or they're sitting at a table someplace else, but I'll tell you where they're not. They're not standing up in front of the class lecturing. Sit and get, right, sage on the stage. That's not happening. So the kids are engaged. The other thing that makes it so amazing is that it's personalized for kids. So we have a million and a half kids in our state. If I asked you to pull up a picture of your son or daughter or your grandchild or your niece or nephew and said, which one of them is the most unique child in the room, you would not be able to answer that question. That is part of the power of digital learning is that it allows teachers, no matter what languages are spoken, no matter what the cultural background, no matter how far behind a kid is when they come to second grade or 11th grade, you can personalize, through the software, you can personalize learning for kids. So I have a couple of slides here that just shows you the difference between the old, the, the, the left is our traditional instructional model and the right is the digital age learning model. So one size fits all instruction with, and instructional resources. A, your average textbook assumes that a kid reads on grade level. Well, let me tell you, most kids don't read on grade level. And the ones that do are ahead of grade level and they're bored. Personalized learning and flexible resources optimized for each student. Fixed places and times for learning within the school building. Again, that's 130 years, one room schoolhouse. Not, not a whole lot has changed. Anywhere, anytime learning, inside and outside of school. You, the governor and I visited a school a couple of weeks ago where the kids were Skyping with kids across the state reading poetry to each other. A bunch of fifth graders, it was incredible. Teacher-centered instruction with the teacher as the expert, teachers as disseminators of content. Again, that's why kids are bored, because it hasn't changed since you were in school. This provides for student-centered instruction, individualized learning, teachers are facilitators and coaches. So the teacher is no more or less valuable than in the prior model, but I would argue even more valuable because it frees them up to interact with the kids instead of standing at the front of the class. Printed static text, often out of date, is the dominant medium for educational resources. I've seen kids, like, on an iPad, demonstrate their understanding of the circulatory system by tracing with their finger the, the blood flow throughout the body. That's much better than a multiple choice test. Which brings me to assessment. Um, my daughter, my, my eighth grader, pulled up her grade online the other day and saw that she didn't have the grade that she thought she had, but there had not been a grade put in the computer since 429. She's got six assignments that have not been assessed yet. So she, it's the end of the year and she doesn't really know what her final grade is going to be which is very frustrating. Um, 
you know, I've got one that couldn't care less if that were the case. But this one, <laughs> this one really wants to know what her grade is. And you know what her teacher told her? Don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> so now I'm going to have to decide. <laughs> Am I going to have a conversation with that teacher or not? Maybe I'll send my husband in to do it instead. But anyway, um, when in a digital age classroom, a, the, you know, the kids, if they're working on their iPads on their own, they do the work, they hit submit on the screen, and it immediately goes to the teacher's iPad, and she can look and see who missed what. So where are the misconceptions? What do they not understand? And then she can go right over and address that group of kids, problem solved. Instead of waiting a week, because, I, I mean, uh, grading is, is hard, especially the older they are. And the, I mean, as a high school English teacher, I often spent my weekend grading essays. Um, but there are, digital age learning and software allows you to do other things and to assess in a more immediate fashion. So, I want, I'm, I'm hoping this is going to work. I want to give you an analogy to take with you about what this means can mean for kids. So if you think about sports and you think about coaches, you think about like football or basketball or other sports, traditionally someone films the game, right? And then the coach looks at the film and then maybe Tuesday after the game they sit down and they look at the film, right? And they'll, the, they point out what, you know, what went right, what went wrong, but it's, it's not immediate, okay? So my, my eighth grader that I just mentioned is, is a, um, <coughs> was a gymnast, and she's too tall to be a gymnast. She's taller than I am. She's, she's really too tall to be a gymnast anymore, and so she switched to track and field. And when, when we moved from Johnston County to Cary, we found out that a, there is a, a pole vaulting coach in Apex who has his own outdoor sporting arena, and he has coached several state champions in pole vaulting. And let me tell you, this is the cheapest sport any of my kids have ever done. And he is an, an incredible coach. And so my daughter started pole vaulting. And here is a video. Oh, shoot. Why does it say it's on YouTube? Anyway, so I can explain it. So, oh wait, here we go. Let's see if it goes, if it'll go this way. No, probably not. Um, so when she, we were at a practice one day, and she, you know, you can see that, you know, you're trying, this is the, the, the bar that she's trying to get over. It's actually a bungee cord. And she just, she couldn't get over it. She could not get herself over it. She's got the form down. That took, a, that took several months to, to learn how to do, to, to run with the, with the, the stick. Um, but, let's see, I don't want to do that. I just don't know how to use Max. How can I go from current slide? Is it a view, is it slides or, which one? Take the youngest person in I know, that's why I'm looking right at him. <laughs> the slide menu. See down toward the bottom, next slide. Okay. Okay. So what her coach did, but it's still not getting, how do I go back to view? Presenter, upper right. Yep. Just close that out. OK. So he filmed her vaulting. And he, he's got this app called Coach's Eye. He filmed her vaulting. She came over. He was able to draw on, on the <laughs> iPad what she was doing wrong and what the angle needed to be. Because the way you gain height in pole vaulting is all about the position that your body is in at the time. So he showed her that, explained by you know, rotating and drawing lines exactly what she needed to do. She went and did it again. She made it over the next time. It's absolutely incredible. And so what I suggest to you is that this is an analogy for how digital learning looks in the classroom. It gives the teacher a chance to give feedback immediately to students. 
to explain right away what they're doing or not doing. Not to mention the fact that it keeps them engaged in the process and makes them more likely to own their own learning. Here are the four counties I mentioned before. Rutherford, Davie, Rowan, and Green. These are counties with more than 50% poverty, most of them 80% poverty. Um, higher test scores, you can talk to any of these superintendents. Higher test scores, improved ACT scores, lower suspension rates, lower dropout rates, higher graduation rates, higher college going rates, and increased scholarship attainment. One school that I want to highlight in particular, there's a very forward thinking principle in Stokes County. And he, five years ago, took over an alternative high school that is for kids who've been kicked out of their neighborhood high school. So this is, this is their last chance. Okay, these are kids that are going to end up in the system in some way, maybe jail, if they don't graduate from high school. 30% of the kids in this school have special needs, have an IEP. 3% are homeless, 12% are teen parents, 90% poverty rate. In 2011, they implemented a digital learning platform called Odysseyware that was 100% personalized learning. So a little bit different than what, than what more mainstream schools are doing. He's tripled his graduation rate, 86% success rate, more than doubled or almost doubled their attendance rate, and their average suspensions decreased to 69%. <coughs> or sorry, decreased to 26%. In, and that's a, that is a very short amount of time for a school because schools, schools are not nimble. And to take that group and turn that ship around is just incredible. Um, portable, project-based, global, personalized. Th th those are the four pillars of digital learning. What we still need to do, we still have to find a way to solve our problem with attracting millennials into teaching. Um, our schools of ed, our en enrollment is down uh, about 30%. So we're gonna see a pipeline problem over the next few years. So just as I, as I wrap up, um, lateral entries are down 50%. Millennials don't go into education because there's no room for advancement. They want a job that's going to provide them a way to move up. And the only way you can move up in education is to leave the classroom and become an administrator. And a lot of teachers don't want to do that. Um, and so we have to find a way to provide a system that allows some kind of promotional track um, that also benefits students as well. And that's something that, that would be a, a long session item that, that we're currently working on. So as Donna mentioned earlier, 57% of our general fund is appropriated for education. 70% K-12, 22% for the university system, and 8% for our community colleges. We've asked for $426 in new money for education. And most of this is for teacher pay, and then another chunk of it is for digital learning. Um, House and Senate, fortunately, everybody's on the same page somewhat with, with, with um, teacher pay. I think everybody recognizes that it's something that needs to be um, Im improved and, and done a little bit differently. Um, but it's all building on what has happened with this administration since 2013 in, with teacher pay. So with that, um, I don't know that we have time for questions, but sorry. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think, um, do, I think there are apprenticeships that come with an industry recognized certificate. So that would definitely count towards, well, absolutely. And, that, and, we, and again, that's where that gap is, <coughs> that big gap that you, you know, the 439, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jen. Am I like uh, 
That was my experience too. Is it, would you say it was about 25 years ago that she experienced that first wave? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I have a question about lateral entry. You said it's down 50%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What's the, the profile of someone who goes into teaching? And, and I'm assuming you're defining that as they come into teaching from business, Correct. Or industry. Correct. Or the military. Than, yep. Rather than going through a traditional education school and, and yeah. teaching. Yeah. Who does that and why is it down? Um, I don't know why it's down other than maybe the economy, um, people not being able to take a pay cut to, to, to go into teaching coming from, from the private sector. Um, I will tell you that unfortunately when you look at um, that particular group of teachers, they're, they're, they do worse in the teacher evaluation system than people coming from a school of education, coming from a traditional route into teaching. Now that's worth looking at because why would that be? You know, why, why would they not do as well? And this is controversial because DPI is getting ready to institute an emergency licensure procedure because of our shortage, which means that people will come out of the private sector, hopefully to take these jobs. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not able to tell you what, um, what sectors they're coming from I mean, I, I know that there are a large number of people who, you know, you can retire out of the military at a pretty early age and go, and I, when, when we've lived near bases, um, often I taught with a lot of people who, who have retired and started teaching, but, um, you know, I've met some, I've met a couple of science teachers who've come out of, um, you know, an RTP or something like that, but, but not very many, mostly military. Well, I think the follow-up to that is North Carolina private institutions to be able to train lateral entry teachers. Mm -hmm. Texas probably has the, the highest number of lateral entry teachers, not only because of size, but as percentage. The other thing on digital learning, you know, this isn't our first foray into digital learning. Back in the mid-90s, North Carolina and its budget <coughs> appropriated $100 million to digital learning. And it gave us a kickstart against other states. We dropped that funding. We're trying to get that funding back. We got a plan in place, but we we're going to have to be able to sustain it. Right. And, uh, you know, we often today talk about trying to catch up to other states with one to one programs. And really, students are bringing two devices to school today. So if, we're, if our goal is a one to one, initiative we're setting our our sites pretty hot uh, low pretty low and then the last point is you know this 67 percent goal is extremely important you know the governor has the, the proposal to implement the western governor's university and hopefully we'll be able to get that done this session mm -hmm. yeah absolutely time for one more I guess where I'm from Moore County, and the biggest problem we have right now is classroom capacity. Mm -hmm. And you, when you depend upon your county commissioners for the funding to build new schools, we're running up in Moore County into the tier system. We're, we're 
not eligible for financing because the southern part of our county is wealthy and the northern part is bad. And you, if, if, if you can't have enough classroom space for the kids, you got a problem. Our solution right now there is to go to a special high school that would be located on our community college campus mm -hmm. and that would allow kids before graduation to chart a, a career path. You can go to, you can take college courses or you can take welding. Mm -hmm. and you can take it's an early arts. college. It's a superb thought and I'm here because I wanted to meet you today because I want to talk it up and work we're going to do something with that. And Good. We've got innovative, innovative administration. We've got a, 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 a very innovative people around our county, and we're going to beat our capacity problems. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, the early college model, North Carolina doesn't get enough credit for implementing that throughout the state. It's an incredible program and opportunity for, for many, many kids. It's not traditional. Special school serves three high schools. You get an immediate pushback about, well, what are they doing? Traveling time, this, that. If you can, it's, parents can object to it. Yep. So, All right, Catherine Truitt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Mom.